And I kid you not, like 20% of all financial advisors have a lighthouse or a compass or a tree as their logo because they're thinking literal. So, so you have to, after you have your vision and you have your audience and you, ha you, you have something that's true to yourself, now you have to decide how to represent that in a way no one else is. And that's where, if it's literal. podcast. I'm your host, Emily Bender. I'm here with my very special guest, Robert Sophia. Robert Sophia is the CEO of Snappy Kraken and has over 20 years of digital marketing experience. Among marketing automation programs for financial advisors, Snappy Kraken is ranked number one in customer satisfaction and is also the fastest growing according to the 2020 T3 Morningstar Advisor Technology Survey. Hi, Robert. How are you? Good, Emily. How are you doing? Doing great. Well, I'm really glad that we got the chance to talk because I wanted to get your thoughts on what's going on in the space of marketing and social media tools and automation and advisor marketing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you and Snappy Kraken and how, how you got started with that? Yeah, absolutely. I've always been a marketer. Uh, it's my passion. I, I was a marketer in my teenage years working in my family business and then I was a marketer in my first job and, and I just, I've really always focused on marketing, but marketing has evolved a lot. So naturally as things have moved digital, I've moved digital. Uh, I got in the financial industry about uh, 2004 and I saw a real marketing vacuum. Uh, tends, tended to be a very buttoned up, very traditional, very formal, stiff sort of industry. And of course, generally formal, stiff, vanilla marketing doesn't perform that well. So I knew we could shake things up. And I've been focused on doing nothing but helping financial advisors grow through better marketing uh, since that time. Yeah, it is stiff and vanilla in many ways. And something that I've experienced, um, I have financial advisors as clients as well. It's not the only industry that I work in, but you know, as we were talking about, um, something I've noticed is advisors might find kind of copy and paste content from certain services. And then you have advisors all over the country who are saying the exact same thing, like yeah. copying and pasting the same posts or blog posts. Do you see that happening? And why is that a problem? Yeah, it's very common. It's very common. And I think it, it really started to happen a lot more um, in the mid 2000s as people started using social media and not really knowing how and, and some agencies and marketing companies popped up and started saying, hey, look, you know, just pay us and we'll do all your social media for you. Um, you know, we'll do all your, you know, here, you need email templates, here's some email templates and, oh, you need a website. Great. We'll build you a website and we'll just send out all that stuff automatically. And it sounded really appealing because all you have to do is swipe a credit card and all your marketing problems are solved. Mm. Um, and so that proliferated and you've got literally every big financial firm in the country buying platforms to do all this stuff for all of their advisors. And when you have a platform with 10,000 advisors on it, all doing the same thing, then the marketing has the opposite effect it should have instead of differentiating and creating attention and, and driving business. It just ends up creating this completely flat marketing playing field where nobody stands out. And it's definitely a, a problem in other industries too, but especially uh, for financial advisors. It is a problem across the board because so many companies do just sound the same. And I've noticed this, especially during coronavirus. <laughs> The, the risk also involved with that is if you become one of these hero type brands, like, oh, let's, let's embody the hero archetype where we stand for this or during Black Lives Matter, we stand for diversity, but are you really walking the walk? Like, what have you done? And then it becomes dangerous to say and put that, you know, fly that flag and, and someone will check your homework and maybe you aren't standing for that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it's, it's really a function of a few different factors, I think. One of them is a lack of creativity, and the other is a desire to conform uh, and social pressure. And I think a third one is is the the goal of coming off credible because you're in a money business, right? You want to be credible. So you've got those three things at play. Uh, generally, financial advisors they're very analytical types. They're not super creative types, so they don't push the envelope. 
Then you've got what other advisors are doing. That's the social pressure. Well, they're successful. They're doing that. I'll do that too. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon. And then, you know, lastly, you've got this, well, this is what's traditional. This is what's trusted. If this is what Merrill Lynch and Edward Jones and Morgan Stanley and the big wirehouses do, I'm just going to look like that. And I'm going to pull in that imagery because it, it looks safe. And, and when you combine all those factors, you, you really end up losing the most powerful thing you have, which is your individual authenticity and uniqueness. And, mm -hmm. and being true to that, like you said, when you're true to that, that's going to draw people to you. When, when it's just an act, then it, it, people find out that it's a facade and you actually undermine trust, which is the opposite of what you want to accomplish. Yeah. Do you think people are afraid to be themselves or maybe they don't know what that means to be authentic? What, what does that mean? I think on some level, most people are afraid to be themselves. Uh, if, if we're honest, like all of us are afraid to be vulnerable because, you know, it, it means that somebody could criticize you or not like you. And it's much easier. I mean, it starts in school, right? Like there's a reason when kids are kids, they, everybody is going to need to buy the same tennis shoes or wear the same backpack. It's almost like part of society. And when you're different, when you don't have those shoes or that backpack, you're actually ridiculed. And I know as adults, we, we grow out of that, but not completely. And there's something inside of a lot of business owners. Um, they, they're trying to ride a line that just makes them look like, okay, this is a safe place to do business. But what they actually should be doing is just exposing their personality, their likes, their dislikes, their strong opinions, because actually that's going to draw people to them that are like them. And that's what you need. When you do that, you obviously run the risk that some people won't like you. But I would argue that to get a lot of people who really do love you and like you for who you are, you have to be okay with some other people not liking you and, and ridiculing you for that. So yeah, it, it takes some courage. It takes some uh, fortitude and a comfort level with I'm going to be who I am and I don't care if people don't like it. Completely. <clears throat> I was thinking about that in regards to Twitter. So I've done some little experiments myself this year on Twitter. And I have found that when I am really opinionated, it's a 50-50 chance that I'll gain or lose followers. <laughs> and just to keep an eye on it, it's interesting to like, I watch them go down when I send out a tweet that I know is probably going to be not received that well, especially because you can't, you can't use your voice, so the tone might be lost. But when I send out stats, everyone's retweeting it, everyone's liking it. It's like, you know, 34% increase in smart speakers during coronavirus. Like, 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 this is brilliant. All I'm doing is regurgitating a stat. Yeah. So what do you think about that? I mean, what, what kind of content works for people I mean, with the financial advisors even? Yeah. Well, th this is one of the most difficult questions to answer because it depends so much on context and what works in one context or even one period of time may be different in another context or a different period of time. Uh, it could even be uh, on a different channel. It will completely flop where it thrived on, on one. And so to really master the ability to market effectively on every channel is it takes a big team and it takes a lot of strategy and it takes a lot of research. Most solopreneurs and, and small companies can't do that. They might be doing well to master one channel. And so what you really have to do is you have to analyze like what works on this channel at this time period. And a lot of people do that individually running little tests like you did. Um, we do that on a national scale uh, every year, twice a year, we, we do a massive study. So, our last study analyzed over 5 million data points. We, we, I mean, we sent over 5 million emails alone. So we look at subject lines, we look at open rates, we look at click rates, we test calls to action, we test image placement, we test image colors, we test font sizes, we, ta we test font placement. All that stuff gets tested and, and, and multi-tested. And then we're able to see, okay, this is how to get the best performance on Twitter. This is how to get the best performance on Facebook. This is how to get the best conversions on a landing page. Um, and then you use that data to make better marketing decisions. I know that's a luxury we have. Not every small business has that. Um, but you have to combine your creativity and your uniqueness with data 
not just trusting your gut, but also relying on the data. And when you get those two things right, when there's true creativity and uniqueness combined with solid data, that's when marketing magic happens. Okay, so you mentioned subject lines and colors of buttons, and I know this is really technical, but I have to ask you. It's probably fresh on your mind too because you just released the report. Um, so which button colors work in emails? Yeah, um, well, actually I'll tell you, we don't use buttons in emails. We, we've found that buttons in emails do not perform as well as inline CTAs. So when we, when we write emails, instead of doing newsletter formats, and a lot of people come to our business and they're like, why don't you do HTML format emails? Because we've tested them tens of millions of times, literally. And we know that to get the highest click-through rate on your emails, the best way to do it is to use a direct response copywriting style in micro paragraphs or sentences and to include multiple CTAs, which are often the same CTA worded different ways throughout the copy and in the PS. So that's how we do it. We don't use buttons or button colors in emails. Now, landing pages are, are a different story. That's good. I think simplifying email is just easier on everybody. What do you think about email though? Do you think it's broken? Do you think it's still effective? Where's it? We have Slack. I use Slack much more than email. What about you? Yeah, well, we, we use Slack absolutely in our company. And, and we almost have a, it's not a rule, but it's, it's almost a rule. Like don't send anybody in the company an email. Company uh, email is only for communicating with outside companies that aren't on our Slack platform. So Slack is a closed environment and for real time one-to-one -one communication, it's beautiful. But email absolutely is not dead. Email is performing. We, when we look at every, every single marketing channel and we analyze the performance and response rates, invariably the highest ROI is coming from building and nurturing an email list over time. And the actual highest response rates and click rates are coming through email. Now, my caveat is, Emily, I'm on this with you, and I am not testing voice yet. So maybe you, you would tell me that voice has a higher ROI, and you might be right, and I'm not an expert. But, but as far as the traditional channels go, like email is performing better than any other channel. It's so funny to me because I keep hearing that, and I've been hearing that for 5, 10, 15 years and waiting for it to change because all you think of is, oh, my gosh, email. It's like direct mail, you know, but it still does work. And maybe part of it is because I think of the email inbox as very, <clears throat> excuse me, personal. It's very sacred and intimate. I mean, I don't give my email address away freely. I have a bunch of dummy ones for when I sign up for things, right? And I've given this tip out before on this podcast, guys. If you are signing up for anything suspicious or it's commercial or you don't, you don't know for sure, if you can trust it, add a plus sign and then a hint to yourself after your name before the at symbol. So it would be Robert plus Beetle moment at gmail.com. And then you would know if some random emails you at that address, Beetle moment shared your email. You can't trust them. And they, they're violating can spam probably. So yeah, yeah that sacred inbox. Um, I get surprised sometimes when I, when I still get so much spam and awful email and I'm, I don't know. Slack is such a better experience, but maybe it's because the people who are receiving your email have raised their hand in a way that following you on social media isn't as great of a, you know, relationship. Well, you know, there's so many different approaches for different companies and I don't want to get emails from the NFL. I don't want to get emails from Coca-Cola, although I consume both of their products, but there are certain people I want to get emails from like professional advisors, my CPA, my attorney, my accountant. And if they have advice for me, I want it. And when you get an opt-in, if your business is one that provides a service or an advice and you're, you're delivering value, that's really what it comes down to is value. If, you're, if it's relevant and it's delivering value, then it's generally going to be accepted. Email does get abused a lot. And, and that's part of the problem. I personally use SaneBox, which filters out like every single email that's part of a newsletter. And, and if I want to add them to a safe list, I can. But I, I get at least 500 to 1,000 emails a week I never even see. Um, and so that does create challenges. But if you're a good marketer, and this is really what it comes down to, like 
you have to be strategic, you have to deliver value, and there are certain things you can do with an email that will make people grateful they received it. And that's not something most companies get or do successfully, but it can be done. Yeah, that's a good point. So I was thinking about email and social media and it feels, it feels so noisy and cluttered and it's really hard to be effective. And when you are effective, I guess it's almost just like life. It doesn't matter. You're like, well, you're only as good as your last tweet. <laughs> what are you going to do next? <laughs> I mean, that's one of the reasons why voice is exciting and interesting to me. But I mean, do you think that this whole, the rigmarole of everything we have to do in marketing now, like, yes, you have to have your social presence and you have to do your email marketing and you make sure your website is optimized. And I mean, that's all, frankly, a lot of it's tactical. And sometimes people forget the foundation at the beginning of who are we? What do we stand for? What is our true brand? Do you ever feel like it's just exhausting or it's so hard to stand out because it's gotten so noisy and democratized? Everybody's participating there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Every channel goes through that evolution. It starts out quiet. It has early adopters. It's easy to get penetration. It's easy to build an audience. And then more and more adopters come into it. And then it becomes louder. It's harder to get an audience. And then finally the advertisers come in and then it really gets noisy. And then the late adopters, they're showing up at the party and they really struggle. This is like the evolution of every single social channel that's out there. And you're right, voice is a new frontier, but it's going to get there at some point too. So everything is going to continue to become more crowded. And that's actually why we're seeing the rise of things like better mail filtering applications and ad blockers. I mean, digital advertising is much more challenging than it used to be. Everything gets noisy and then consumers demand their space back. And then it creates uh, new types of challenges, you know? So when you look at all of that, what, I think what you have to understand as a marketer is first of all, don't be late to the party. Like use when, when there's a new channel and there's an opportunity and your audience is there, like try to, try to engage with it, try to learn it, try to get involved. And if, if you're not a professional marketer, then leverage professional marketers who can help you. And then not only that, but you have to be willing to adapt and evolve and change the way you use that channel. I mean, an algorithm can change and everything about how you use that channel effectively changes. So you have to be educated and stay engaged. And I think the last thing is that you, and probably the most important, is that you have to make sure no matter what channel it is, no matter how you're using it or when you're using it, that you know your audience, that you are using it in a unique way, and that you're using it consistently. And, and no matter what channel, no matter how busy it is, if you're, if you're really resonating with a specific audience and you're doing it consistently, and you're doing it uniquely, you will cut through. That's why the most unique and most bizarre things go absolutely viral. And you can't do that every day as a typical business owner, but you can do it in a small way just by continuing to be different and you gradually create that mental imprint and you gradually carve out your space. And what do you need? Do you need a hundred dedicated fans? Do you need a thousand? Do you need 10,000? Well, it's a big world and you can chip away enough on any channel to build an audience the size that you need. Chipping away, building the audience. Yeah. So what is it to be unique? What does it mean? How to, for somebody that's just starting out, I think they might feel overwhelmed with it. Like, how do I, how do I be myself? How do I be unique? How do I stand out? What should I say? What would you tell them? I would say, after you know clearly what your purpose is and what your vision is, which you have to know. I mean, you should never go into business if you don't have a purpose, if you don't have a clear vision. And there's a book, uh, Vivid Vision by Cameron Harold, I highly recommend. And you, you need to step back and, and 
write your vision out for what it is three years from now. And we've done that for our company. I've done that for my business. I, I do it personally. So you have a driving, you have an anchor point, right? Okay, so that's the start. Then you have to ask yourself, what's it gonna take for me to get to that? And who are the right people that are gonna be able to support that? Who are the types of clients or customers that I want, that I wanna work with, that I will enjoy being on this journey with? Not just people that um, can pay me money, but people that I want in my life. So now you know your vision, you know the people that you wanna bring into it, and then you have to ask yourself, what is going to appeal to those people? What's gonna resonate with those people? And that is true to me. And, and you have to figure that out. Like your, your audience has to like it and it has to be true to you. And when you figure that thing out, the last step is how do you represent that and how do you communicate that in a way that's not like anyone else is already doing it, that's not literal. So what I mean by that is, um, let's say that, I'm gonna, I'll use an example from financial advisors because it's something I'm, I'm super acquainted with. Um, they, they start thinking about that. They have their vision. They, they have their clients they want to help. And they start thinking about how they're going to help these people through storms of life. And, and, and they're going to be an anchor point for them. And pretty soon they're like, yes, a lighthouse. We are like a lighthouse and we are an anchor and, and a compass. Like we, we're going to guide them like a compass. And, and I kid you not, like 20% of all financial advisors have a lighthouse or a compass or a tree as their logo because they're thinking literal. So, so you have to, after you have your vision and you have your audience and you, ha you, you have something that's true to yourself, now you have to decide how to represent that in a way no one else is. And that's where if it's literal, if it's the first thing that comes to mind, you should scrap it and you should reset until you find something that, that hits that note, but in a way that's never been done before. Like snappy Kraken? <laughs> what is that? People, I know a kraken is it's like an ice monster, right? <laughs> what uh, is yeah, it? a sea monster. It's a mythological sea monster, yeah. A yeah. sea monster. Why did I think no, it was it's, icy? It's, I don't know. Well, that would be like, um, what's the, uh, what's the yeti? ice? There's an ice monster. Yeti. That would be the yeti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so your name, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you. It's because I said, oh, <laughs> look at that. He's doing something different, which is the whole point of our conversation, right? So I noticed you, I, I've been hearing your name kind of, you know, at conferences and throughout the industry, Twitter, all that for a few years. Um, so in, in that, how do you translate kind of how you named your business and not just for naming a business, but for finding that kind of um, the symbol instead of a tree or a lighthouse or an anchor, like instead of being literal, do you have an example of someone that did a great job with that where they weren't literal, kind of like how you aren't? Oh, there's, there's a bunch of examples when you, when you start to open your eyes and, and think about marketing this way in business. Um, I mean, we're both using Apple devices. I mean, look at that. Who on earth names a computer company, Apple? Like, right. Of course. What's the association, I, right? I should have been more specific. I meant in the, in the financial advisor world. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so many, uh, they, they, <laughs> um, but not in the financial world. Like that, that's, this is where. Yeah. I'll tell you what happened to me. I went to my first financial conference as a marketing company. And this is my last marketing company, which I sold. But I, I looked at my booth. I had named my last marketing company, which I started in 2009 and exited in 2016. I named it Platinum because it was the best. By the way, I've learned lessons along the way, right? So this was not the best business name, but I had two partners. They were super traditional. Um, they were also funding it. I was a, 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 a um, sweat equity partner, right? So the name was primarily chosen by them, but I agree with it. We named it Platinum. And I went to a conference and I'm, I'm, I'm walking around and here's what I see everywhere I look. I see Platinum and Peak and Pinnacle and everything is like a cliche on quality or growth or being the ultimate something in every single booth. And I, I'm just looking around and everybody blends in. And if, if you look at financial advisors, like everybody's green or blue logos and like, it's just, there was no standout. And I, I swore to myself when I, when I do my next business, it's not going to be like this. 
And so we went through an exercise, which it's, it's an exercise anybody can do if you're thinking about branding or, or, or something like that, where it has to be uh, unique. All the, the handles have to be available on every platform. It has to be fun to say. It has to be memorable. It should be sticky off the tongue, which means it should have like strong consonant sounds in it. Um, it should be able to be heard on the telephone. When people say it, they should be able to understand it like clearly. It can't be like too confusing. Um, it should make people go, huh, what? And stop and want to know more. And we have this sort of rubric. And so we went through the whole exercise and we had, we whiteboarded all these different names, but at the same time, it had to tie back into what we do. So if you look at our brand, like Snappy Kraken, people go, huh, what's that? But the Kraken is actually a powerful sea monster. Generally, they're like squid or, or octopus. They have lots of tentacles, right? Eight to be exact. So in our system, our platform, it uses one central hub to automate and integrate dozens of technologies like tentacles going out. So there's a literal association, but the Kraken is also kind of a big, scary beast. Well, not ours. He's simpler. He actually only has four tentacles. He's smaller. He's cool. He's wearing shades. He's not intimidating. He's fun. So is our company. So is our culture. We're snappy. We make things happen quickly. So we built a brand. We built a character that would be different that still had a story. And that takes creativity and effort. Mm, I like that. I like the idea of the tentacles in the hub. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, these are really good recommendations. I think everybody could follow, even if you're already pretty seasoned on social media, it's a good reminder about the authenticity. Um, well, we're at that part in the show, Robert, where I ask if you have a book or podcast recommendation. Well, I already gave a book recommendation. Yep. So uh, I will tell you also, like I, there's the one business book I keep on my desk and I use it a lot. Um, and that's the book Principles by Ray Dalio. Um, which it's like this thick, but it's outstanding business principles and you can learn a lot from that. Um, so I continue to consume that book and reconsume portions of it and reread portions of it. Um, and I use it when I build things for my company. Um, and then as far as podcasts, as much as I'm grateful to be on your podcast, I'm not a podcast listener. Okay. I, am, I am a Blinkist fan. So I listen to book summaries all the time, but I don't listen to many podcasts. There's I a few. I haven't tried Blinkist yet. So you recommend that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it, that's what I like. So I really enjoy book summaries. And that's just, so when I have time audio and I'm going to let, like, that's, that's my go-to. Oh, and how, how thorough are the summaries? How long do they take to listen to? Um, usually 10 to 15 minutes. That's great. I'm so picky about books. If I'm not really grabbed within probably 25 pages, I just jump ship. So I end up not finishing a lot of books. Yeah. So well, that's why book summaries are great. Yeah. I do listen to the Beancast too, if you're marketing. Oh, the Beancast. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, the Beancast, that's a, that's a marketing and advertising podcast. I've been on that show probably, I don't know, 10 or more times. Okay. And it's so much fun every time. And, and Bob does a really great job because he has different, he has four different guests on every week. It's a panel discussing current events in marketing, advertising. So anyone who's interested in that, check out the Beancast. Yep. Bob Norp does a great job. Um, well, those are good recs. Blinkist. Okay. You know, I have some brand awareness of Blinkist because of, I think, podcast ads that I've heard about it. Because there's awesome. an overlap in those listeners, right? Yeah, very likely. Yeah. Just not with me as much, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, let people know where they can connect with you online, Robert. Snappycracken.com. That's S-N-A-P-P-Y-K-R-A-K-E-N. So snappycracken.com or on Twitter, uh, Robert Sophia at Robert Sophia. Perfect. So this is episode 74. We have show notes with links to everything we've talked about at beetlemoment.com slash podcast. And thank you so much, Robert. This has been a really great conversation. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Enjoyed it. <laughs>